from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potts cast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. There you go. Awesome. So, we have a special guest. Yeah. Say hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Travers. He is my Facebook friend who travels the globe. And you're your software engineer? Yeah. Data- and yeah. right now a database engineer also. Database engineer. Okay. And you're in Germany these days. I'm in Germany these days. So, yeah, all the way from Germany. And from Saginaw. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was uh, in Saginaw for two years when I was a kid. Yeah. Oh, just two. Just two years. Yeah. Oh. But it was in the only integrated neighborhood in that time. It was, oh, what it was part of town? Really, really. Yeah, uh, 1980, I think. Oh, and so, <laughs> so, um, east side or west side? I don't remember. All I remember was uh, an apartment complex, and uh, I, I, the racial tension. I saw there were really scary and, and left a pretty big mark on oh, yeah. oh, the way I've it. looked at a lot of things in the US. I believe it. Was, it. Uh, it was it's still not good. <laughs> I can no. really see that. Because right now, uh, Saginaw is fractured. Black people are on the east side of the river and white people are on mm-hmm. the west side of the river. Um, almost mm-hmm. full stop. <laughs> I mean, certainly... That's not like legally enforced in some way, and you'll find your occasional white person on the east side and vice versa. But that's like that's the arrangement. That's the yeah. detente. Yeah. And I th- I think actually people's reaction to uh, folks crossing the river has gotten hostile. even probably even maybe worse than historically. Yeah. Because the the economic stress is just ramped up so high there now. Yeah. And you know my. Uh, my example was the the shooting of that um, mentally ill black man. Yeah, uh, he was on the west side of the river. Yeah, wielding a kitchen knife, I think. Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Yeah. Um. Anyway, and then yeah, shortly after I moved there, I befriended a, a barista and was hanging out at the Red Eye Cafe. And mm-hmm. uh, just a couple of weeks after that, he was uh, killed in some kind of a Gun random down. shooting through his front door, yeah. mistaken wow. identity, like kind of thing. So, right, somebody thought they were at a different apartment and shot him through the door. Yeah, so this immediately tended to sour my impressions of Saginaw. Well, <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> we did go on to live there. For, we lived there for seven years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we have... Uh, Usually we um, we do a uh, walk a week where we talk about what kind of walk we've done because we've made an effort to get out, get the kids out, go for a hike every weekend. Yeah. We have no walk. We have no walk. We've not been <laughs> successful this week. We've, uh, we talked in the last podcast about how uh, basically everyone's been sick since before Easter. Since before Easter, yeah. And, and it's yeah. kind of lingering in the household as like... It's no passing from person to person. person. Right. So several of us are healthy again, and yeah. several of us are still not there yet. I'm still not 100%. But I'm definitely yeah. feeling better. But yeah, some of the kids are still just coming down with it now. And like just sleeping all day. Yeah. So that's been absolutely terrible. Worst Easter ever. I call it <laughs> Easter Fool's Day. Yeah. Ouch. So, um, yeah. We had something similar over here, actually, and uh, we all got sick. Um, I think about a week before Easter, but Ugh. yeah, and it's and it's you and your. Do you, do you have in laws with you or extended family with you? Uh, yeah, no, no extended family. Just just my wife and I and three kids. So. Okay, yeah, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough to really you know ruin a weekend with illness. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We've got um, we've got a house guest staying with us and mm-hmm. her children, so we have. A dozen um, of us. We have nine children running around the house. Uh, I don't know what they do to share disease, lick each other's noses or something. It's yeah, just... a viral download. Yeah. So um, one of the, then we usually have a section on what we're reading or mm-hmm. planning to read and watching or planning to watch. And... Yeah, we just got the uh, private government book, which I'm, I'm, I have high hopes. You have high hopes? Yeah. Yeah, we keep getting political books, and then I read them, and I'm like, yeah, uh. there's not all that, you know. But... Um, we went to this. Uh, we went to a lecture last week by uh, Professor Elizabeth Anderson 
uh, a philosopher who talked about um, this concept of private government and how this uh, manifests in um, the workplace. In the workplace, how employers basically became private governments, and she, you know, talks at length uh, about what she means by that and why it's not the most like everyday definition of private. Right. And that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, we've got her book, and uh, if things go well, we'll see maybe if we can get her on the podcast to talk about it. We also, uh, you got to... Oh, no, I was just thinking it might take me a couple of weeks to read it before I could talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we uh, Grace doesn't get a lot of downtime. <laughs> For reading. Or rather, it, a lot of it is downtime, but there's always a, a kid ready to jump on you at any yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, we uh, have been reading Fellowship of the Ring, yes, slowly. which I've read you know multiple times before. But we're reading it to the kids for the first time because some of them are finally old enough to uh, to really get something out of the text, right? And that's been fun. So I keep uh, pausing to interject like my Marxist analysis of of uh, the Shire <laughs> <laughs> and butt jokes and butt jokes because that'll. <laughs> put joshua into a just Stitchy. seizure of laughter <laughs> it's it's kind of fun to watch um so i was talking about bagshot row as a tenant farmer situation yeah and um how the the, the shire is is sort of a it's not it's not really well explained but it's sort of a feudal system it's pastoral is yeah and um when it's not in uh, portrayed this way in the movie, but when Bilbo sets up his party, mm -hmm. he actually has um, there's sort of a doctrine of the elect at play, where there oh. are like the the bulk of the party guests, and then there's also a tent which only can hold um, a gross of people. Yeah, and that's the the party tent. And uh, those are his close uh, family, family friends, friends. And family and friends. Those are the elites. And then, and then outside, everyone else has to stay outside the tent? On, at, like sitting at like benches. Benches you know, and eat. tables, right. So basically throw a huge feast, feed everyone, and then the elites are inside feasting inside the tent. For, for to hear the speech, right? to hear the, uh, um, to hear Bilbo address Goldman Sachs. Oh, sweet. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> And it's sort of like we have now, except now we don't feed the the rest of them. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, no, people are always like, you know, I, you want to go back to like, you know, serfdom. You know, compared to now, serfs had it pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And um, oh, yeah. They, they actually talk about how, you know, the people that had drank so much uh, ale that they passed out, they, they kindly sent... A uh, squad of hobbits and dwarves around with wheelbarrows to uh, wheel to home. scoop them up and wheel them back to their homes. <laughs> yeah, no, they just put you in the paddy. Yeah, so it's um, it's interesting going through this. So, uh, yeah, we keep going with the uh, with Fellowship of the Rings, and I keep finding things that the last times I read it, I didn't really pay much attention to. Yeah, and part of it's in the context of having watched the movie so many times now. Mm -hmm. That the the differences really jump out at me. Yeah, they're in high relief. One of them is uh, that um, there's an extra seventeen year delay in the book between <laughs> the party <laughs> between the party and when uh, Frodo actually realizes learns that the ring is bad and and has he, to go. he has to take it right somewhere. Not not like a week. In the in the movie, it seems like it could be a week or it could be a month, but it's not that long. Gandalf shows back up and warns him, and they basically flee that night. Take off, right? Yeah, in the <laughs> in the books, that takes another seventeen years. Seventeen years in a day. So there are all these anniversaries, mm -hmm. like fiftieth anniversary, and then seventeen years and a day later, mm -hmm. Bilbo and Frodo have the same birthday. It's all these all these like. Uh, Coincidence. connections coincidences that like make more sense in a book than they do in a movie right and there's no useful way to convey yeah a movie. yeah right uh, you could have like a montage of pages fluttering from a calendar but that's kind of played out you know <laughs> uh we also uh have been reading a book that that a friend loaned me called the uh, dangerous case of donald trump yeah, yeah. and grace is rolling her eyes it's all these. It says psychiatrists, but a lot of them are just just writers or, writers, or people people with an opinion. People with an opinion, and uh, they all 
attempt to diagnose without diagnosing in a legally binding <laughs> sense or professionally <laughs> binding right. sense uh, the president 45 and it's it's um most of it's not that valuable i'm i'm reading through it quickly i'm looking for ideas that uh, that maybe i can pull out of this sure but it's you know you call it pretty padded and a lot of the essays are largely redundant from one to the next Mm -hmm. um there's so i just been making like a catalog of the concepts it brings up that i think are interesting to talk about further Mm -hmm. um one is this idea of malignant narcissism and that's your everyday narcissism Right. Um, kind of blended in with uh, traits of aggression and especially sadism, mm-hmm. and so that's that's mentioned. Um, the concept of splitting is mentioned. Splitting is basically where you constantly split your circle of people into uh, bad and good bad on your good. side or or completely. Mm-hmm. And in software engineering, Chris, you might <laughs> you might know this. There are some people who in like software workplace they tend to uh, have this tendency to flip the bozo bit on people. So mm-hmm. it's like either the person is okay or they're a complete bozo and nothing mm-hmm. they do should be, can be trusted should and be nothing, trusted nothing they bad. say should be taken seriously. And in, in some mm-hmm. workplaces that can be managers. And I've had this happen too, where like at some point a manager flipped the bozo bit on me. And then for the rest of my employment at that given company, I never could get, Mm -hmm. anything uh, you know anything out of that manager whatsoever any assistance any thoughts any mentoring any help basically on anything anything. yeah so Mm -hmm. uh one of the authors mentions hypomania which i think is probably pretty clear in Mm. trump's case he's you know brags about how little he sleeps and he's tweeting at six in the morning or five in the morning um yeah. But again, we're not able to actually I'm not a diagnose it. I can't diagnose anybody. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems consistent with. So, anyway. Okay. So, let's see. I mean, what, what are you thinking? Are you imagining that this might be valuable ideas for. Um, it's not really valuable for anything having to do with. Trump himself, but like it's less more like general knowledge about it's more like general knowledge, like the um, concept uh, from um, narcissism, the concept of flying monkeys, all right, which are basically the circle of people around the narcissist who enable them and like carry out their their attacks. You know, fly monkeys, fly. Oh, right. Um, right yeah. And this is maybe, um, you know, I'm all, I'm all about the metaphors, right? right? As an English literature major, you know, I'm all about the metaphors. So when I think of Kellyanne Conway and um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders and all or, these other people as Trump's flying monkeys, it, or like their people behavior maybe makes in your own a, life, really. Yeah, their right, behavior okay. makes a little more sense to me. Oh, okay. So what else we got here? Any other reading? We, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot. I could, I have more notes from my blogging about fellowship. Uh, Do you want to mention what's up with the house? Oh, yeah. We got, we got an offer on our house. Oh, my God. We got three three offers. We got three offers. Two very low ones. Low, yeah, truly low ball. Truly low ball. And actually, we've gotten three of those total. Three, three, three very low Low. ball offers. And then one that's like in spitting distance of what we owe. Yeah, and we said yes to that offer, and now we're trying to figure out inspections and all that. Yeah, all so, those contingencies. So what we're going to have to do is is borrow a large sum of money to make up the, the difference. difference to close the house and pay off the <laughs> le- leftover part of the uh, mortgage. Yeah, so it's Yay. we're going to wind up. Best case scenario, we're going to wind up losing o- total about about half the purchase price of the house. Yeah. Oh. Over sixty thousand dollars, we will have lost. Yeah, but the idea uh, is that if we just close close everything, and I take out a loan, a fixed loan at a fixed APR with a fixed period. Mm-hmm. It's as far as our responsibility for the property and everything to do with it. It's done. It's done. My only remaining responsibility is to pay off the loan. Right. And if I can manage that, this will squeak us through. Without destroying my credit. Without destroying your credit 
and I don't know. We'll have we'll be done with the headache of the house, the second house. We'll be done with with owning a second house, which it sounds like such a luxury, you know. <laughs> it's, Our second home in Saginaw. It's been only a liability. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's that. So, um, oh, we did watch a, uh, we watched a Doctor Who serial called Earthshock. Did I miss that? You saw the end. Okay, That's I saw the, the very end. This is a famous serial, and it's, um... It's the one where uh, it, it oh, features. Oh, that's the one, right? Where spoiler he... alert! <laughs> it features the famous uh, death of a companion, which I think they've never quite done. Right. There's there's this one. I don't think they yeah. ever like. Adric, A D R I C, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Wikipedia says um, with a brilliant mathematical mind, wearing a star-shaped badge for mathematical excellence. Adric is well aware of his own intelligence. This, coupled with his relative immaturity, leads to a personality that is abrasive and occasionally crosses over into arrogance. As a result, Adric is one of the least popular or even most hated of the Doctor's companions. And every time I watch him, I'm like, oh yeah, I love this guy. I love this guy. He's great. (laughs) And I think that's because I can kind of identify with with him as a younger and so version of my own arrogant self. The spoiler is he's arrogantly trying to do this thing where he like fixes something solve to, a pu- solve these codes. Solve these codes to s- take back control of the ship that have been locked out. Right, so he can like re-steer it so it doesn't hit the earth. He's not able to do it in time or like he solves it in time but one of the cybermen comes and blows up the yeah, console. Yeah, they, they destroy the lock before he can fe- feed, in feed in the it final in. code. And then uh, the ship plunges plunges into the earth. Back in time. Back in time. Yep. Destroying the dinosaurs. Yeah. It's the explanation for... That's like why the dinosaurs... Yeah. So the thing is structured where there's an adventure on earth in the present where they're down in these tunnels right. surrounded by dinosaur bones, bones and whatnot. And they speculate right. about how the dinosaurs... how did that happen? The doctor didn't know. And at the beginning, he's saying, I've always been meaning to go back and find, find out. out. Now we know. Yeah. Who's so, Edric? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the 80s doctor who are pretty much a wasteland as far as enjoyment but we watched the fan edit and which are better yeah they're this is really one of the better, better serials and if you put it in the hands of someone who can actually edit it down in, into a more concise uh, piece of storytelling it's kind of fun and yeah. i kind of like this one so mm-hmm. yeah there's one more book i want to mention okay. um one of my people i follow on twitter mentioned a book called Mistaken Identity, Race, and Class in the Age of Trump by Assad Hader. Mm. And, uh, Hader, not Hader. H-A-I-D-E-R. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm going to pre-order this book because I've been very interested in identity politics and especially how it's being argued over so viciously yeah. by Democratic centrists. Oh, right. right. Trying to seize basically claim claim the moral high ground claim via, the moral high ground via their via some identity right or or their identity purity right their identity pol- political purity yeah right? so there was a, a kerfuffle this past week where um dare lo- you say it dare you say his name <laughs> say his name sanders <laughs> uh was pounced on by Donut Twitter, we call it. <laughs> Donut Twitter? Yeah, there's nothing in the middle. It's just, oh. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the Democratic centrists, who many of whom were were black women, oh yeah, yeah. who were attacking him for um, basically not having what they saw. Well, first of all, a lot of just lies were repeated about what his happened? his speech mm-hmm. at the MLK MLK Day. Commemoration. Okay. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, good. Okay, something went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, MLK Day thing. Oh, the MLK Day thing, and um, yeah. First of all, people were like, you know, he just muscled his way in, and you know, gave this speech For no criticizing reason. Obama. You know, just you know, like a like he showed up as a turd in the punch bowl, and no one could stop him. <laughs> <laughs> You can watch the video and re- you know See what and read the yourself. transcript of his speech. You know he was invited there and he yeah. was given multiple standing ovations and you know yeah. 
And he he was saying a true thing about the Democratic Party, which is their um, program has not been working nope. given their electoral failures. And basically said that, you know, this, and he called Obama charismatic. Yes. Right. But yet this was somehow some, wrong some unwarranted subversive attack on everything holy and <laughs> sacred. You know, Obama <laughs> was perfect. He was the only scandal free president in history because of his perfection. And therefore, how could, you know, what an awful guy <laughs> or, something. or something. Yeah. Anyway. And then all these black women, I'm through with Sanders and uh, essays, media and posts and whatnot. And I'm trying to understand why. I mean, besides just working in the service of centrist Democrat, democratic yeah. operatives or whatnot, right. but but the analysis seems to be has something to do with that they um, they think uh, Sanders is too class based in his in his criticism. Oh, that he supports more of a left Marxist class analysis of what's going on economically, hmm. and they really want to see it entirely centralized around race. Oh. And he doesn't generally do that. That's, that. that's a mistake, too. But I believe it's a mistake. But uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, and especially it's a mistake to criticize him for this because in America, class status tracks race yeah, status so well as far as well, your economics go that you can practically use one as a proxy for the other. And, and on top of that, you've had the fact that you know, while in, for example, England, you had uh, industrialism built on the backs of uh, serfs who were ejected from their land. Right. In the U.S., it was the freed slaves that yeah. were those destitute masses. And mi migrated and, north for, for yeah. work in the Rust Belt. Especially. Well, and in particularly in reaction to um, ter acts of terrorism in the South. Sure. But, sure. Um, but you know, you, I don't see how you can understand race in the U.S. without understanding class. Yeah. Right. Like you fundamentally don't understand race and institutional racism if you don't understand class. Yeah. Like you're not having the conversation. You're talking about something else. It, it seems that way to me. But I, supposedly, this the point of this book is that it says something valuable about that intersection. That intersection. So of I want to. I want to see what it says. I'm gonna. I'll probably order a copy of that. Good one. deal. Yeah. No. So we're basically a money stream for publishers. <laughs> well, if we well have you check the Potts House for money, <laughs> go see if they've got anything. We can sell a few books. <laughs> if we get, uh, I keep I actually keep tweeting at publishers when they announce a book. Say yes, everyone. I keep tweeting at them, saying we'd love to review this. I'll, I'll review it on my blog, and we'll discuss it on our podcast. Sure. If you'll send us a copy. Um, I actually have to pin a friend of mine down about how that's going to work because I think there is a process and they'll just send you one. Do you have to fill out a form? Yeah, there's like a form or something. Is involved. there a blood test involved? No, no blood tests. Okay. Anyway, all right. I'm sure we'd pass though. Any uh, so you, so have you have you started? I know you don't get through books that quickly, but have you uh, started on uh, anything recently you want to mention? No, just just private government. I, yeah. I started that. Uh, you got in, into it. It looks promising. It, and it does look promising, yeah. Okay, Chris, any uh, any books or media you're excited about you'd like to mention in well, this segment? I'm, I am still very slowly working my way through two books by Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is The Accumulation of Capital, oh. which is a really interesting look at um, how capitalist economies um, fund uh new businesses because uh and how this relates then to um foreign policy and so forth and luxembourg's basic thesis was that as soon as you have an economy which is built on investor ownership of business mm -hmm. this necessarily means that the economy cannot sustain itself without um, undermining other economies both at home and later on through uh, imperialism and colonialism abroad Grace is like uh, throwing hand signs and I don't even what, uh, waving her arms or practically, <laughs> practically high-fiving herself. So I, I, think, uh, uh, I think she likes that idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, it, it's a really interesting book. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the second one was uh, Rosa Luxemburg's um, Criticism of the Bolsheviks, mm. which okay. is interesting. Because this is effectively a Marxist communist criticizing Lenin. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a very, very, very interesting, um, different uh, viewpoint than uh, typically what, what we tend to see in, in uh, yeah, at least in the U.S. Right. Um, and I, I got to reading it because uh, my workplace is one uh, train stop away from Rosa Luxemburg Platz. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Yeah, That's no, seriously. Fun. I, Alexander Platz, then Rosa Luxemburg Platz, then Zina Felder Platz. So I could often see the Felder Platz. But. Cool. <laughs> so we, we've got books like that where I keep picking them up and digging at them a little bit, but I, I find that they're really not suitable for bedtime stories. One of them is um, <laughs> Kropotkin's yeah. The Conquest Just of bread. bread. Oh, yeah. And that's still on uh, the shelf. And uh, again, it's like it's it's there staring me, staring at me, urging me to read it, but... Um, I, I'm during the workday. I mostly listen to podcasts, and that's not. But I should I should see if there are more um, audio versions of some of these books that are now probably out of copyright. You know, that are public domain. Public domain, ready for yeah. yeah. And you know, but then what I find out there isn't. And I'm like, okay, now I have to make one. <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, so uh, for listeners that might not might recognize her name, but she. Rosa Luxemburg was a, a political philosopher yeah. and a uh, Marxist and uh, Polish, became a German citizen. Mm-hmm. Have and you... joined a bunch of communist uh, movements, but they weren't Bolshevik movements. Uh, right. And later was uh, murdered uh, near the end of World War II. Two. Uh, no, World War One, actually. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, Despite her heavy criticism of the Bolsheviks, uh, she was sufficiently popular in communist circles that both Lenin and Stalin had to say positive things uh, about her in uh, memory. So, right. <laughs> okay. Have you have you heard uh, much about this this uh, actual comedy, The Death of Stalin, that came out? I haven't heard. No. no. I I watched it on an airplane, and it was really funny. Because you did watch it. I. I watched it and I thought it was a very interesting drama. Yeah. And then I found out it was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a little dangerous when that happens. Oh, that was a comedy. Oh, oh, okay. I, okay. <laughs> I see I, it, I guess. <laughs> I think it's so I think it's probably I mean for one thing it's all the cast none of them actually have the correct accents oh right and they're right. all they're, they're like, all they're <laughs> not yeah they're and they're largely comics or or you know not com not, not um you know considered like academy award winners, movie no. winner style <laughs> right, actors right. and they um yeah they, and they don't make any attempt to to do phone phony russian accents which so is probably better probably better that way but yeah. then you know from my uh, hearing some reviews of it it sounds like it's it's so dry but sardonic you sardonic, know right. like um i mean it's funny enough just to show what's happening what's happening right well, no know. you could tell a straight you could tell a totally straight dramatic retelling of the last two years in the united states yeah yeah and it would be hilarious <laughs> it would be a comedy right you, you don't have or to make com- anything out a tragic comedy you don't have to set up any punch lines right just tell the story straight right right <laughs> Well, that, that's people think that you know there are like there's like a way to act comic, and there's not. I mean, yeah. there's like a way to you can act like a slapstick comic. Sure, you sure. You can do clowning, and that can be no, funny. But the material that's not has the, to be funny. That's though. not the best comic acting. Like the best dry humor is is acted totally earnestly and straight. You know, right. So yeah. anyway, and, and I guess the other thing is that the and I, I don't know what the uh, intended. Um, uh, genre of the graphic novel was, but apparently the movie was also based on a graphic novel. Oh, was it? Okay, I didn't even oh. hear about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. So, so apparently, it's it, it's a retelling of another retelling based uh, with an attempted comedy, and the comedy totally falls flat. But the story is interesting to watch. So yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll watch it. I I, I'd I'd love to see this movie. I don't think it's suitable to take the kids. <laughs> oh, is it in theaters now? Or I'm I'm, not, I'm. I think it was only. I think it didn't get a widespread theatrical okay. release. Like you know, it's not going to be up the street at the IMAX. Or, oh. You know. Well, no, like, I, I like think a I lot saw of the most a thing in passing movies. in my Facebook feed. I haven't heard anything else about it. Yeah, it probably only showed in in big cities. Okay. 
So, so are we looking at like getting a DVD then or something? Yeah, probably at okay. some point, or or it's probably available on iTunes. Although I hate renting digital downloads; that's the craziest thing. I can't even. I just I'm deeply uncomfortable with this idea of renting a file. <laughs> Gonna rent this file? Yeah. It's bad enough that they, you know, I have to authorize it. it it's like DRM protected. Yeah. But then it's also going to evaporate in a week. How's like, that? No. No. Yeah. Okay. So, are we there? We ready? We are uh, main topic. Main topic. So, this week, I thought I'd step into the fire and talk about um, gun control, or lack thereof, and put my iron in the fire and see what you know, see what happens. So here we are. Here we are. And actually, it's it's why I invited Chris because I really appreciated uh, something he said about. Um, uh, Repealing the Second Amendment, but with caveats. I always uh, I watch Chris's comments go by on Facebook, and I'm always intrigued, and I'm often tempted to jump in, but I kind of realize that if I start, I'll actually be up half the night writing comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, I will say he he often surprises me with his analysis, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound like exactly what everyone else is saying. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. So I appreciate whenever I come upon a new argument, I appreciate that it's, a lot. It's golden, just yeah. golden. So um, I'll, I'll start my my personal argument is and has been for some time that I favor um, a, a more a better regulation of guns in the United States. That guns should really, basically, according to the Second Amendment, be well regulated, and they're not well regulated now. So we should do that. We should well regulate them well. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that, that includes... Um, yeah, people like to forget the entire first clause. Entire first clause of right. the um, that, that would include you know background checks, but most importantly, insurance, that you have to be insured, you have to be trained, and um, if you have a domestic violence record, that, that's effectively a ban, because it's a, such a high predictor of future violence. So... That would be, you know, effectively be a ban and confiscation for domestic violence perpetrators. And here's the most important part of gun regulation for me is that these regulations would apply to law enforcement and military as well. And I think once we, once we do that, you know, background checks, carry insurance, up-to-date training, basically the same kinds of regulations we have about using a car, mm -hmm. um, and add on a layer with domestic violence yeah. because of the, the correlation with uh, future violence. Um, I, I feel like we don't need to do anything else. I don't think we need to talk about the Second Amendment any further. I don't think we need to... I just don't think anything else is necessary. What about um, dividing guns up into like permissible classes of, of weapons? Are you into I, that? Support not, that? Don't care? I, I kind of don't care. You just don't I, think it's the biggest... I don't well, think it's the biggest fish to fry, and yeah. I really think that insurance carriers will solve that problem mm -hmm. straight up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important that you have to have insurance if you're going to have a gun. Yeah. The the uh, if, if liability was actually, you know, an issue... Placed properly? Right. Uh, every gun manufacturer would have gone out of business. A long time ago. Yeah. And so... Um, and again, these regulations would apply to law enforcement as well. Yeah. If not, and in fact, probably more more tightly um, tightly regulated and policed. As in, it's the same regulation, but they're checked annually. So, do you have any convictions? That means mm -hmm. we need to take your guns. Do you have? Mm -hmm. Is your insurance up to date? Are you, is your training up to date? That would actually be um, enforced more strictly on uh, law enforcement and former military who are like co contractors and security people, right? Yeah, the the, the uh, correlation between policing and domestic violence is you know really I'm troubling. not gonna I'm not gonna cast any aspersions about any group. Well, it's but, it's, you know. it's a huge it's a huge percentage. But if what that means is they don't get to carry a gun now, that's what that means. Yeah. Um, because these are the regulations that I think will actually have some impact on gun violence in the United States. But all that said, I don't think regulating guns better in the United States will actually have a significant impact on our mass violence problem. I, I'm coming to think that it's planned and wanted as stochastic terrorism. So that's my thesis right there. 
there is some gun regulation that we could use that would be valuable and reduce violence. But that that's not the same as our mass violence problem, which I've, I'm coming to believe and I've come to believe is a stochastic terrorism problem. That's me. That's what I've got to say. But I wanted to hear what from Chris a little bit more about his um, repeal and replace uh, suggestion. Okay. So uh, the basic idea behind this came out of several discussions I had with different people about um, <clears throat> sort of the direction that the Second Amendment uh, mm -hmm. has in the U.S. and the way people interpret it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my view that you can't read the Second Amendment by itself. Oh, um, yeah. mm -hmm. In fact, the Second Amendment needs to be read in context of two parts of the main body of the Constitution in Article One. Mm -hmm. The first one being the uh, clause that says that Congress can provide forth and call forth, uh, sorry, provide and call forth the militia. Mm -hmm. um, so now you actually have a tie between the reasoning of the Second Amendment and the constitutional powers vested in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, the second and the more important one is uh, is the ban on appropriating money for standing armies for more than two years at a time. Um, there is no other area where Congress is told you have to have a two-year uh, sunset on any appropriations you make. Mm -hmm. um, only when it comes to standing armies, not when it comes to navies. Navies can be funded, you know, with 10-year funding plans or whatever, right. but, but armies can't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the basic idea here is that the Second Amendment appears to have been in, in place as a means to provide a political check on the spending relating to the army. And the real tragedy is... Um, what it's become is something else entirely. It's become basically the consumer side of the military industrial complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah Which is so perverse anyway. It's the hugely yeah. profitable. Right. Yeah. And so, so what, what you have is you have the, this problem. The, the Second Amendment was intended to be a common good, mm -hmm. and now it's becoming a consumer right. A consumer and so right. My, yeah, yeah. So, so the way I've, I've thought that maybe this could be solved is that we look back at this value judgment that was made that said an armed populace is better than a uh, standing army, and we take it from a different viewpoint. So uh, maybe a constitutional amendment which uh, repeals the Second Amendment, but also repeals the um, ability of Congress or the states to hold standing armies. They can't have one now. Yes. <laughs> you just can't have it. <laughs> you can't have one. You can allow the populace to be armed and you can call them forth. But uh, maybe maybe if they have a declaration of war and maybe if they have a draft where the rich are not exempt, then, then maybe that would be okay. <laughs> maybe we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but we, we all know how practical that would be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. They, there's always um, a way around it. Right? I keep seeing yeah. proposals like that where, say, the next time we <laughs> declare war, it's going to be enshrined in the Constitution that... Um, Every sitting senator, congressman sends a child has to, send, himself. has to send a child to fight. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and the thing is, I mean, it doesn't mean you won't ever have wars, um, but no. it does mean that that they won't uh, that they won't be waged in the way we do today. Um, Which is to not not basically undeclared police actions all over the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, the other side to it is that I'm um, as as I've continued studying um, the ancient world. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the one of the major turning points in Rome were the uh, Marian reforms. Are, are you familiar with them? Marian reforms, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Grace would it be was a history I major. I, I don't. Yeah, for yeah. Your audience? yeah. Yeah, go for ahead. me too. Go to Grace was a history major. I I don't know that much about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, so Rome fought this big war in North Africa called the Yugoslav War. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, I believe the army was, or I, I can't remember what, what Marius, uh, Gracchus Marius' uh, role was at that point. But the real, but although Rome won the war, the real difficulty in waging the war was the fact that Rome at that time had an armed forces, which consisted of a militia of the wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the militia members were required to furnish uh, particular gear depending upon their social class. Right. They brought, um, they brought their own gear. 
they brought their own gear. So if you were particularly wealthy, you were a horseman and you brought your own horse and your own armor. And if you were a bit less wealthy, then you were an armored infantryman and you brought your own armor and your own weapons. And if, if you were if you were less wealthy than that, you would you would just bring weapons and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but this was really difficult to wage a war in this way because, you know, you're calling on the polit- the politically powerful people to come in and fight the war for you. And uh, sometimes they don't like to do that. Yeah, it's not any fun. <laughs> so, um, so what Marius did um, as consul of Rome was to uh, reorganize the uh, Roman military structure. And what he did, uh, instead of having this, um, the, this militia of the wealthy, what it became was a um, volunteer army where the state buys the weapons. Mm-hmm. And the senators then act as commanders. Mm-hmm. And um, more than anything else, the set up the fall of the Roman Republic. Right. Because um, no longer do you have um, a, a common defense, which is in fact a common defense. Mm-hmm. Instead, what you have are a bunch of poor people who have enlisted to the service of a particular senator hoping to get a reward in the, at the end of the day. Right. They survive. For loyalty. Yeah. Right. They get something. <clears throat> right. Kind of like Americans right now. If they survive. Maybe yeah. you can get a college degree. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's still, but it's still promoted that way. Yeah. Right. And and so this is you know it, it occurred to me that uh, particularly after Vietnam we've had our Marian reforms where you right. know everybody has to register for the draft, but we all know that we're never going to see a draft. We're never going to see a draft. It's um, not going to happen. Yeah, sign the, the girls up too. It did sign look them all a, up. It did look a little scarier in the uh, in the eighties. It looked, yeah. at least when I was registering, it looked conceivable. People were actually worried. Happen. One of my, know. one of my uh, classmates, wrote, "There was no way to register as a conscientious objector, so he just mm-hmm. defaced his uh, paperwork, Drafted. writing all over it. I am a conscientious, conscientious mm-hmm. objector, right. but we did have to um, register for le- for selective service in order to be eligible for student Soon aid." <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the the stick, I guess. Right, and that's yeah. why we can float the idea of drafting young women now, because mm-hmm. in no our one, heart of no hearts, one believes it. We yeah. don't believe that there will ever be a draft. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, sure, sign the girls up too. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. you, there's effectively no pushback or even rational conversation about what that might actually mean in practice or mm-hmm. what. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I mean. I mean, <clears throat> but the other side to it is, you know, I mean, our military is now engaged in such of an arms race that mm-hmm. we spend more and more per soldier, more and more per fighter jet. Uh, the costs per fighter jet are quadrupling roughly every decade and have been since you know, <laughs> wow. the 40s. Um, God. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To the point where, if this continues uh, and our budgets continue growing linearly, uh, we'll be able to afford one fighter jet in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really great. It'll be a great fighter jet, though. It'll so, do everything. But tell time. Yeah. There's so, no room so, for a clock on the fighter oh, jet. Oh, it doesn't fly. I'm There's so clock. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it'll, it'll everything else. 100 percent of its weight will be taken up by electronics. Yeah. I guarantee you. Yeah. Um, but uh, a but trillion lines it, of code. A trillion. Yeah. We'll reach a trillion lines of code yeah, if we all work together. We can get there. We can do it. But but the thing is that what this means is that what we have as a military is is effectively just useful in invading foreign countries. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not foreign. really a defense force. Right. No. Yeah, it's all. It's just there for projecting force abroad. I mean, if you look at our so, infrastructure. Who would invade? <laughs> they'd get here. They'd ha- they'd basically bankrupt themselves trying to bring our our infrastructure up to some minimal standard where they're not, you know, oh, yeah. poisoning their own citizens with lead and you know. God knows what it is. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not invading there. It's a wait, what's the what's the term? Shithole. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not invading. That place yeah. is a shithole. Not going there. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the first time I ever heard the, the phrase "shithole country," it was by uh, somebody who had volunteered for Hillary Clinton's campaign, who was <laughs> yeah. referring to the U.S. because of living conditions she had seen there during uh, volunteering. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, dang, people live yeah. there. They live like this. Yeah, exactly. actually, we do. Exactly. Actually, we do. Sorry. <laughs> 
Uh, subsistence, you know, when I've always thought to myself, I look around the United States, I'm like, I don't know, subsistence farming looks pretty good right now. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying. Let's go back to, to pe- being peasants. I can take it. I mean, we, have, yeah. we can be peasants with iPhones. No. <laughs> so, so, so that was basically the idea and, and why it came about, and just simply, you know, arguing that, that maybe we should maybe we should reevaluate this and um, actually have a conversation about the role of our military in the world and the role of our military in the world in our um, violence problem. Because, as I hear people say, the Second Amendment is about the military. It, it was yeah, yeah. right yeah. that it, it's it's about the military it was about the military and yeah, about slave rebellions as well yeah. <laughs> there's there's that aspect to it there's yeah. that part of it where um there are domestic disputes that we want an armed force to respond to right and slave rebellion was like the thing up for most in people's minds at the time right yeah <clears throat> but that said we need to have a an understanding of what we're actually talking about. And people always poo-poo this. Well, you know, you don't actually know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. And, and yes, the mass violence is absolutely horrifying, and it shouldn't happen. And I don't mean to dismiss that or put that aside. But if we're going to start talking about legislation, we need to talk about legislation. Mm-hmm. Can I bring in a few comments from this uh, from this slate article that I? Yeah, please do, please do. All right, so this is just a this is just context, um, and unfortunately, I haven't prepared as well as I'd like to. But um, always a problem here. <laughs> there is an identifiable population that is extremely dangerous, volatile, and likely to commit violent crimes. Yes, but it is not diagnosable as mentally ill. No, and this is a big fallacy. You see a lot of people jumping on. You know, it's not well, a mental illness. it's not a gun problem. It's a mental illness problem. But the people <coughs> that tend to be mass shooters mm-hmm. are not generally people who are committable, mentally, committable, mentally ill would in some have way. Been you committable. could, yeah. And right. the people who are mentally ill in general are not the people who tend to lash out in this violent way. But there are some characteristics that these people have in common. And that is, um, you know, aside from outliers, like uh, I guess this this woman who was had her videos demonetized mm-hmm. showed yeah. up at YouTube headquarters and right. did a shooting. Um, that's pretty unusual, but it just shows how dangerous it is to have your videos demonetized. No. See? See? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh that is that they are often perpetrators of domestic violence. And you suggested this when you talked about domestic violence convictions. Right. Felony domestic violence is the best predictor of murder. Not necessarily mass shootings, but murder. But murder, right. Uh, the chronic pattern of failing to modulate aggressive feelings. Violent crimes committed by violent people, almost always men. Lonely, isolated, blame others for their problems, and lack the skills to manage their anger. Mm-hmm. So example is the, the Parkland shooter, right? Yeah, sure. Multiple people had called the FBI, including his mother. Right. But there was a- who said he had anger issues. Right. The Pulse nightclub killer, violent altercations as a teenager and a history of violent spousal abuse. His yeah. first wife said that leaving him saved her life. Yeah. Columbine killers. Virginia Tech killers, cruelty. Um, Mm -hmm. And yet these people may not rise to some kind of diagnosable sociopathy. Right. They they don't have some kind of pathology that can be quantified and then maybe treated or incarcerated in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And, And mind you, I'm not a big fan of the police state. I'm not a big fan of locking people up, right? And I, I think if you commit domestic violence, there should be some kind of um, consequence. You do your time, pay your debt, and we're back. Um, so I'm not talking about locking people up for life. But I am saying that maybe these pe- this group that has a clear prediction of future violence, maybe we shouldn't arm them. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and, and the thing is that one of the big problems that you have in, in that discussion is the fact that as long as you see the Second Amendment as an individual right and as right. a consumer right, right, right. Then, then you have this huge amount of um, uh, you, what, what you can't do is you can't have this question of uh, sort of community judgment in terms of who can have yeah. uh, can or can't have the gun because and, then yeah. it's like a community judgment who gets to have rights or not. Do you want to do you want to talk <laughs> yeah. a little bit about about Heller and how this became an individual right where it historically hadn't been interpreted that way? Oh, is this the one from the sixties? No, no, this is the one from no, that uh, was... 2008, I think. Oh, okay. Miller was the one from the sixties, I think. But... Miller, okay. I'm Heller, sorry. Heller. Yeah. You're talking about Heller, and that yeah, was Heller when? Was a, yeah. That was the, to, the aughts, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, fill me in, because I'm confusing some cases. Go well, ahead. I don't, you know, again, I'm underprepared. I had a, I was going to, actually had a PDF to print out the whole decision and read it and highlight it. <laughs> but I believe this was like an 08, I could be wrong, mm-hmm. and it was, uh, Scalia wrote the majority of opinion, go figure. Right. And this was, uh, had to do with a case in Washington, D.C., Mm-hmm. where uh, the court's decision basically, and again, without a lot of details, just affirmed that individuals had a right. Had a personal the, the, right. The right was a, a personal right mm-hmm. and not a right you know, that required some kind of context as far right. as you know, that militia, however you define it. And I, I do want to open something up just a little bit because I can see sort of a, like wheels turning for people listening. Mm-hmm. Um, number one, Yes, I think regulation is a market-based capitalist approach. Mm-hmm. We live in a capitalist society, and I want to stop people from dying. So my yeah. regulatory approach works in this system. Regulatory, almost like like product safety. Right, like a product safety thing. And then secondly, um, I fundamentally kind of, uh, you're almost winning me over, Chris, to this idea of rights, especially around abortions and human rights and that this is a good question, a good open question, right? I'm almost there. So I've come to question at a core level the rights ideology, not because I don't think people have rights exactly, right? But rather mm-hmm. that we as a community you're have a, needs. You're not a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian. Yeah. No. We, have, we as a community have needs and we have to work together to, to meet them. And there's going to be a lot of ways to do that, some of which won't look like what we're used to or maybe even what we really like personally. But given that, I think even in the framework of rights culture that we have, I think you can take away someone's right to bear arms, just like we take away people's right to vote sometimes. Mm -hmm. We take away people's rights sometimes, and get this, our idea is that it's in service of the common good. A lot of people who call themselves conservatives today uh, aren't even aware that that this sort of ideas they're they're espousing when it's all about rights, they're really libertarian. Liber- it's a libertarian it's, idea. And, it's a libertarian fundamentalism. And it, yeah, yeah a, a fundamental. Yeah, and so you saw that a lot with Tea Party, Tea yes. Party folks. How it's all about rights, but you know, you, when you actually try and discuss the Constitution, you'd find that they really were incredibly ignorant of the Constitution. <laughs> Almost as ignorant as they are of like Bible readings. Pretty frustrating. <clears throat> like um, they know the reading, but they don't know any of the um, yeah. <laughs> context. <laughs> yeah. All right. Did, so, so that's, yeah, go, I think go. it's really possible that even in our rights obsessed culture, that we can say, yes, there's a gun right, and we're going to restrict it in this way. When people, you know, in other words, there are ways you can, um, <clears throat> um, void your right to bear arms mm-hmm. just like okay. we decide that and I think this isn't appropriate but yeah. we decide that felons void yeah. their right to vote we, you know, I don't necessarily agree that I mean I think we should get felons voting again as soon as possible right you know? right. but, like, yeah. but we do that so we do there's that. a precedent right it's not unheard of it happens and we do that because we think it is important for all of us as society that's the reason we take rights away from people sometimes yeah, I don't I honestly see the point of that one personally, but um. well, and, and, and the thing is, but the thing is that one of the things that I would like to see would be um, if if people if people in the U.S. want to own guns, mm-hmm. um, it would be very nice to not only just have a training requirement, but to have a group training requirement. Oh, you have to you can't do it in isolation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right, and you have to train with 
people in your area, <clears throat> and they get to decide whether you are safe to hold to handle that also. So this guy actually Cer done? Certification is <laughs> right. actually by some local body. Right. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'd get rid of these cases where some dad takes his three-year-old to a gun range and gives him a mach <laughs> machine gun, and surprise, surprise, things go horribly wrong. wrong. Who knew? Yeah. Who could have seen that? <laughs> but, <clears throat> anyhow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to come back to this... Uh, Stochastic terrorism concept now, I, or I do. do you I, want me to? Because I'll embed that in the show notes, but I, I, for people I, who might not be familiar, I I would like to open that up just a little bit yeah. because I I think because I, I does everyone knows I'm an anarchist and I <laughs> need to tell everyone every, something like a, a guy that does. Knows. What is the, the guy that does uh, CrossFit? Hey, I'm a CrossFit vegan. You know, yes, I have to tell everyone. Right, right. So I have to tell everyone I'm an anarchist. Um, so, like, why are you advocating all this state stuff, or why are you doing this, or whatever, you know? Um, my main thing is that the elites are dangerous people. <laughs> They're dangerous yes. people. They can't be trusted. Stop lionizing them and trusting them. And this, I feel, isn't just, <laughs> just another data point. It's just another data point. Mm -hmm. And this particular article, this guy is talking about like right wing television and radio hosts and so on. And I'm not really there with that. But his larger thesis, um, basically, stochastic terrorism is the use of mass communications to incite random actors to carry out violent acts that are statistically predictable, but individually unpredictable. In, in the context of the time when he published this, uh, 2011 or so, the, there was a series of shootings and we also had just seen things like sarah palin with uh campaign oh, ad yeah. graphics that actually had target like gun sites on right, gun democratic sites on target opponents target. and right it was it was really kind of like yeah wow. and then gabby giffords got it you know got hit and, right yeah and i think that was writing in that context he felt and glenn beck was, was <laughs> there was the tides thing the tides foundation oh, where right. glenn beck did some big long rant about the tides foundation right. which was largely and people were responding to this that. unknown organization before then and then you know bingo a few days later a nut job nut job shows up yeah you know, with a gun and so it, there was more context at the right, time right. maybe and now it's it's it seems like a more innocent time really <laughs> <laughs> God. but but i Funny think how that works. his larger story here is a real thing Right, and what's really great about it is a it real thing. I, is, I think it is. Or, yeah. or, and I great. I'm doing air quotes. Great, is that you have complete plausible deniability as a terrorist, and people keep referring to the mass shooters or the people engaging in mass violence as terrorists themselves. Can I can, can I quote here? Go for it. Yeah. From the original uh, essay, which started out as a, a diary on Daily Coast, and mm -hmm. is now a blog post. Mm -hmm. At each step. Plausible deniability increases through the diffusion of responsibility. Right. Oh, it was just a lone nut. Nobody could have predicted he would do that, and I'm not responsible for what someone in in my, my audience, audience does. does. Right. Right. And arguably, you're not. Yeah. Arguably. And probably right. not in a legal sense. Right. Not that we don't have any yeah. legal sense. But I think I'm concerned about the use of the word terrorism that's used correctly because terrorism is violence committed on civilians yes. for a political end. Yes. That's what terrorism not, is. Not military actors. It's not a military actor. Yeah. It's not and it's also not like random violence. No. That's not terrorism. It's yes. frightening. Right. It's terrifying, but it's not terrorism. Terrorism is an act committed on civilians right. for political ends. So a school shooting it, it generally it's not terrorism it's not an act of terrorism it's not a, in, in isolation right yeah. and it is the, terrorizing it's terrorizing and the shooter is not a terrorist but when you take this frame of using mass communications to incite an actor to do this and you modify it as a, a stochastic terrorism i think it fits because the shooter is the weapon mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the terrorists are the people manipulating the media to this end yeah. that's the terrorist yeah they, they know that they've got an audience of relatively unhinged people right that those pe the people out there on the edge are out there and so just like the like the pizzagate situation they're right. deliberately doing their best to make people more unhinged about, more unhinged about and these more issues kind of, it's kind of like oh, yeah. the russia gate thing the russia gate thing you really want to stir that pot and get people going on mm -hmm. it yeah it's so there's all these things happening where elites 
are consciously stirring the pot. So yeah. th this guy breaks it down. He says, so there are lone wolves, these individuals out there who are poised yep. to commit an act, of t you know, commit this act, this violence act. And then you have to stir the pot. And this is a well-established thing, media thing. Car advertisers do it all the time. They direct their ads at someone who is, yeah, thinking maybe it's time to get a new car and is like on the verge of a decision and they nudge them to make the decision. Yeah, it's well understood. There yeah, are there's a lot of psychology it. about that. In Lots fact, of that's psychology about it. That, when I worked at the Health Behavior Research Lab, Health Media mm -hmm. Research Lab, that was my uh, my boss's area of research was how do you con convince people to to make changes to do things right yeah. like where do you and you find the sort of people on the edge and you nudge yeah. them right there's all these stages that go through and so um now personally i think um that marketing is insidious and dangerous and shouldn't be part of a polite society one of the only classes in college i ever just dropped just walked with, out with uh, extreme prejudice was uh I, I thought it would be a. Uh, a credit in communications and might be interesting and because especially i was a radio dj at the time and production mm -hmm. manager so i decided to take uh introduction to public relations yeah had to leave <laughs> i that was i was so pissed yeah, yeah. my class was the well-managed healthcare organization <laughs> i left in disgust um, <clears throat> all about managed care mm. uh, but no so this guy's idea is that it becomes insidious when these practices are used uh, to deliberately or negligently stir up lone wolf violence. I think they're insidious to begin with, but more so mm -hmm. when it becomes this conscious or negligent tactic to encourage lone wolves. And there's this way in which, you know, when there's lone wolf violence, these are big media hits, you know? It's a oh, absolutely. ratings bonanza, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And, um, and so after you apply the media presser the lone wolves just pop mm -hmm. and you can't predict where and you can't predict to but you can absolutely predict that that's going to happen that's what that's what it's called stochastic it, right it's a statistical process it, right yeah it just increases the likelihood and you can do it by remote control and you really have plausible deniability about it and i was not in the place of thinking, hey, this is stochastic terrorism that we're looking at all this mass violence here. Mm -hmm. Because remember, you have a political end. Yes. Because right now it's still just violence against civilians. There has to be a political end. Something that you want to have happen. Some political action that you want to happen. And so you engage this violence to pressure that political outcome. It wasn't until I was reading about, and I'll have to find the link for you so you can post it. Okay. Um, uh, research that people move their political positions based on their feelings of safety, and that terror moves people towards political conservatism and towards sort of a radical, um, the radical end of the spectrum, and security and comfort makes people more. They were using American terms uh, of. Political, uh, American political terms in the sense of liberal and conservative. The better people are more liberal, the more secure and comfortable they feel, more conservative to radicalize in the conservative end, mm -hmm. the, the more frightened they are. Yeah, and it seems and that, plausible. And now, mind you, it seems plausible. It makes sense. And if we have research for that, like we have marketing research, how can we expect that the elites wouldn't use that information to their ends? To facilitate a political outcome where people vote for and stand up for authoritarianism. I think if you if if you define that conservatism relatively narrowly as specifically pro like pro I don't mean protectionist as in trade. Mm -hmm. I mean like the state will protect us, you know, right. in favor of an authoritarian state that can protect us. Okay, can protect us, and yes. mind you. And it goes along with that libertarian. <clears throat> this strand. movement, the movement to restrict gun rights, the movement, because there's a very strong case, um, a left case, for widespread gun ownership. Mm -hmm. That's a left position. Yeah, I, I, I believe actually that, that true leftists, especially when you lean towards, you know. Like commie leftists. Yeah, commie or Stalinist yeah. leftists. They, they don't strongly, they don't have a strong belief in gun control gun per control se. no not per se but no seriously it's 
And, and actually, just to jump in there, yeah. uh, one of my colleagues at work, who, by the way, was born in Poland, mm -hmm. is a Polish citizen and is working on getting his uh, UK citizenship uh, after Brexit because he grew up in Scotland. Um, oh, okay. He brought up something very interesting on this. He said the United States today is, is on the gun control issue is um, uh, divided between people who are totally unaware that they agree with Marx on the issue of gun control. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, who, um, and people who are very confused about the relationship of the state and power. Yes, yeah, yeah, deeply yeah. confused. <laughs> <laughs> you don't comprehend that relationship yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, the idea that with firearms, we're going to take down the federal government, you know, in absolutely, 2018 it seems absurd. Laughable. But here's the thing. This is the fundamental thing. Yeah, I am under no illusion whatsoever that a state appointed attorney is going to get me out of jail. Yes. I still want one. Yeah, yeah. I have a right, right. to a state appointed attorney. Right. I'm not going right. to waive it just because it's you're not going to do anything. You're right? going to exercise your rights largely because they need to be exercised. They need to be exercised. Yeah. Not yeah. because I'm thinking no, it's going to get me out of jail that's like your right. interactions with the police you know you don't volunteer information you don't just like right. try and you know help to indict yourself right. or help to plan an evidence because on you're yourself, innocent help to search mm -hmm. yourself because you know? you're innocent no you don't do you that. exercise those rights that's because right. you're you're helping to avoid uh corruption corruption yeah. exactly so and <clears throat> and i know i'm an outlier among american leftists but not amongst the left yeah on Bundy because, you know, of all these sort of racial tensions we have here. Like the Bundy Ranch guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, they staged a protest, they were armed, they weren't killed. Funny how nobody got shot. Well right. they did eventually. Eventually one guy <laughs> ended up getting shot, right? Yeah. But he right. it was weeks, right? Yeah. And it really pr pushed um you know, I mean, who raise your hand if you believe law enforcement officers would have been um, that patient with like a, a bunch of Some black, black panthers? panthers. Right, <laughs> I, yeah, whatever. So people point out, you know, they weren't armed with um, Pop you know guns. tanks. Well, they weren't, armed with <laughs> but they aren't, weren't armed with tanks. They weren't yeah. armed with military grade equipment. But the fact that they were armed made the standoff more likely. I'm not even sure exactly what kind of guns they had. I don't know if they were right. ARs. But, or, or what? Um, and so... Yeah, but they had long this, guns. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. And this larger idea that everyone should have access to self-defense, that's the broad idea. That's yeah. the broad leftist idea. Yeah. Everyone should have access to self-defense. Full I'm, stop. I'm all down with that as, like like you <laughs> said, when you know, as long as we have that well-regulated right. in place. Mm -hmm. I th and, yeah. and where, you know, it's also not a requirement because, you know, I have fired guns. I'm not like um, a t complete pacifist and I, I don't no. despise them per se. Mm -hmm. It's just, it doesn't interest me to own one and to keep it in my home especially given my own history of mental illness, because I know who the victim probably would be of a right. gun in the home. You know? Right. Um, so that's... Even, yeah. you know, if not me, then then some accident. Some kind know? of accident. And if you're keeping it in a, a safe, locked up and all that, then it's the the point of like repelling a home invasion or something is is pretty much it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty much lost. lost. So, mm -hmm. I, and that, that's a personal choice which I think everyone should be free to make yeah. about yeah. arming themselves. Yeah, and you should be free to choose how you defend yourself. But your freedom to defend yourself, I and that that's pretty seems pretty basic to me. Yeah, right. I, it is basic. But I, I do think, yeah, the well regulated part, especially given how how rarely you know guns are actually used for self-defense there's this other thing we haven't talked about which is a weird factor in the united states that makes us really different than other countries which yeah. is a very small portion of people own guns but the ones who do own a, a lot, lot of them own yeah. a lot of yeah. guns and right. that really i don't know how to how to account for that really yeah. what were you yeah. gonna say chris yeah. That's actually very interesting because at least my experience talking to people in both Sweden and Norway mm -hmm. is that my sense is that more uh, a larger portion of the population in those two countries own long guns than in the U.S. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, a larger percentage. Yes. Yes. A larger mm -hmm. percentage. 
Right. But the per capita ownership is way down. Right. The only thing it's I can compare it to is, is the, right. the only thing I can compare compare it to is guitarists. Right. Right. Yeah. At one point, I had over twenty guitars, right. and one I still guy. got I still guy. got seven or eight. You right. know, but so I can identify. Yeah. If you think of guns as a consumer thing, which is what this or a tool is, yeah. or a toy, you know, I think that's a critical insight on the pro. You know, on the the level of guitars, like I don't need it for self defense. I want it because it's. A hobby. It's, it's a hobby. It's cool. Right? Then, then it makes more yeah. sense to me. But mm -hmm. it gets crazy. But and that's it. Really is in this consumer space, especially mm -hmm. yeah. It's especially in the United States. It's yeah. really in a consumer space where I think, uh, especially places like Sweden and Norway that have a longstanding, um, I want to say hunting culture, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. um, oh well, it is a hunting culture. I mean, the culture is so much a hunting culture that. I mean, like in the U.S., if you go hunting and you uh, kill um, more uh, wildlife than you can eat, you pretty much have to eat it yourself or give it away. Mm -hmm. In Norway and Sweden, you can actually buy the surplus at the grocery store. It's that's, a, that's great. I mean, right. we did so, we did used to get uh, venison and elk and stuff at a meat mm -hmm. store in Saginaw, but I, I'm not sure they were entirely selling it legally it was yes. like you had well, to ask for it, <clears throat> it i the think bag. they bought it from a hunter and but i don't think it was um 100 legit 100 legit now the, now the, but it was great we yeah, got our, great. We, we got our best meat that way yeah you know? we really well, and, and there are some places in the u.s that effectively sort of um quasi farm free range uh grow wild game for yeah. commercial sale right yeah. Right. But but in but I mean like you go to the store in Sweden and you can buy wild boar, you can buy venison, you can oh, buy Oh wild boar um, sounds sounds fantastic. Yeah. 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 And and you know, I mean these things are, are everywhere. Um mm -hmm. you go to Norway, of course, you can go further and buy whale if you want. But uh, into that. <laughs> if you like that kind of I'd be a little I'd be a little trouble. Well, I'd try it once. Yeah. <laughs> I'd try it once, you know? Yeah. It, it, it I, I will tell you I have tried it and uh I wasn't a fan. It tasted like a mixture of uh, beef liver and tuna fish. Um, <laughs> maybe. But, um, oh, Grace oh. might like it. Yeah, I could get into She's that. She's really into the very I love liver. Game, I love gamey flavor. I love gamey flavors. I love, I love organ meat. Too, but, but, but this wasn't a combination. But like with the tuna? Pleasant. Like tuna with beef? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I don't bet, know. Uh, like cat, uh, yeah. sounds like something that would drive all the cats in the neighborhood berserk with joy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's, I mean, but you can get lots of, I mean, you can get almost all this, uh, almost all this game meat um, frozen mm -hmm. at the supermarket. Um, right. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, wild mushrooms, wild berries and so oh, forth, yeah. which are also harvested, harvested. and sold. So, right. so you have this, uh, you have this sort of wild food culture there. So it, it is deeper, it is deeper than a hunting culture. Right. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. And so a long gun is... A part of that. It's a subset of that. It's not that entirely. Whereas here, it makes, it makes some actual sense. It makes some actual context. logical sense, right? So, may, of course, maybe that's hanging yeah. over your mantle, and it's not loaded because it's not for like a home invasion. Why would that happen, right? right? But part of the culture you live in, right? Yeah. That culture is very small in the United States. Yeah. It's very small. It's there's it much is. more of this culture of guns as a hobby. As a consumer product, as a consumer thing, as a status symbol, and not as mm -hmm. a um, a subset of an indicator of a larger hunting culture, a larger culture of self defense, or culture of um, individualism. But yeah. but yeah, it's, it's not part of that at all. It's almost non-existent no. in the U.S. So yeah, I I don't see like I what is it? I don't feel like regulating that is even. Yeah. Is anything deeper or more profound than product safety? Yeah. Like you're gonna have all these guitars. Okay, don't electrocute yourself. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that, you know that's how I'm gonna go one day. <laughs> oh, he was trying this complicated like live so setup set up. in his basement, and you know, <laughs> fried uh, himself. So it was so sad. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So that's yeah. In that in that uh, space, it, it's very different than say, okay, we're gonna regulate your long guns in this culture where people use it in a normal, reasonable way all the time. <clears throat> well, and the thing is that in these cases, you have a lot of regulation, but the regulation is built out of a different uh, goal. Right. And, and this is something you find 
all um, as a big difference between Europe and and uh, the U.S. in terms of regulatory culture generally. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you know, I mean, a, a great example actually I would point to is Switzerland, and in Switzerland, you know, um, people can buy their military service rifles when they when they leave their um, their universal military service. Mm-hmm. Um, most don't, but they're allowed to. Um, but you have a tremendous amount of gun control that goes into that. Um, yeah, right. yeah. You know, no, the, the, that's baked in. Right. What you heard on the right for years is that oh, the Swiss all just take home their guns and keep them in well, their they, houses, like that do, was but, totally unregulated. But it's not everyone, no, and it's not, and it and it is highly regulated. Right. It, it, it's highly regulated, but it's highly regulated in a local way. Yeah. So the local police get to decide. Uh, this person doesn't get it, and that decision is pretty hard to to get reviewed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You don't really have a lot of national regulation on these things, aside from a few laws here and there, largely because Switzerland has a government which is very, 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 very. Um, how 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 has it been put to me? Um, uh, Swiss vote on everything, and you have to have a majority of the population approve with a majority of the population and a majority of cantons. So oh, okay. right. things right. move very, very, very slowly. Yeah. Um, right. On the other hand, local cantons um, have many of their own solutions. Um, on the ground, and so, right. you know, Switzerland has, has per capita gun ownership of about half of what the U.S. does, mm-hmm. which is still high by global standards. Right. Um, and those weapons are often much higher powered than you have in in. Um, as far as much of the uh, much of the U.S. Uh, gun ownership, they were actually but military weapons. weapons. Right. Yes, yeah. and and they are and they are owned for the purpose of national defense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the thing about it is, it's extremely it, it's extremely regulated. But it's regulated with with an attempt to balance two things. The first one is um, uh, manage the public safety, and mm-hmm. um, as a result, um, you know. People don't have machine guns at home anymore because mm-hmm. there was a mass shooting at one point, and and the decision was made. Hey, you know what? No machine guns at home in battle. A fully automatic fire isn't that useful anyway. Let's just let's just say that this isn't uh, this isn't allowed anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you have on one hand protect the public, and on the other hand you have cultivate uh, a responsible culture for the national defense. Mm-hmm. And what we have in the U.S. is an is an argument that we don't need to do the second. Mm-hmm. And we can't possibly be bothered to do the first, right? Mm. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. and this is the other thing I I hear you know, like between the lines about all of this about Norway, about Sweden, about Switzerland, or even uh, you know China or any of these places, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Whatever the regulation is, it's literally embedded in the culture from which it came. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's relevant yeah. to the culture in which the regulation is being exercised. Mm-hmm. And so um, we, which brings us beyond the bounds of either, either gun control or mass violence, but kind of unites them as subjects. We have a really, really bad culture problem in the United States. <laughs> you think? <laughs> like our, the, our, the cultural landscape here oh is, uh, for lack of a better word, demented. Like it's not well, like... It's a- it's a consumerist culture. It's a I mean, consumerist culture, right. It's like it's no one's personal <laughs> culture. It's hyper, hyper consumerist. But it's just this yeah. hyper consumerist yeah. um, drivel or babble that's being fed to you, right? And then, like, because you have no culture of your own, mm-hmm. this is now your culture. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so, in that landscape, I, I'm not sure what action we could take that isn't capitalist. <laughs> Yeah, to manage it. Well, we can't jump there, you know. Right? No, we can't jump. So there. incremental steps do have to work within the capitalist framework. Well, no, and I think well, that's yeah, that's true. Although I'm not really a big fan of incrementalism. But no. Yeah. Well, so I, th- I think I, th- I think one of the things that's missing in the U.S. though, in this regard, is that you know, I mean, I grew up in rural parts of the U.S. for the most part. Um, after after we were after the couple of years in Saginaw, then we lived a couple of years in. In Battle Creek, and then mm-hmm. my dad got his medical license, uh, and uh, we had to go where they said they needed doctors. So we spent the next uh, seven years in Utah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
one of the interesting things that um, that I've learned from the various parts of the rural U.S. that I've lived is that you know people look back at the New Deal and they see FDR pushing trade, uh, sorry, labor unions and big businesses together, sort mm -hmm. of in this three-legged stool on which society runs. But for, right. for the rural U.S., that wasn't that wasn't what the New Deal meant at all. It meant the work programs coming in and building schools and post offices and electrical grids. And the reasoning at the time was that without this infrastructure, that local communities couldn't uh, uh, steer their own destiny. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've lost in the U.S., and I think we lost it right after Watergate, mm -hmm. is um, we've seen this shift um, uh, basically in both parties. Uh, it's, it's easy to pin it on, uh, it's easy to, to complain about the Democrats, but the Republicans aren't any better in this regard. Or if they are better, they're not better enough to make it a difference. Um, that, that's a, a shift away from any sort of meaningful localism. Yes. Um, and to, to make any of these cultural changes work, uh, culture is fundamentally local. And, mm -hmm. you know, Michigan culture is not the same as... Um, Maine culture. It's not the same as um, California. Utah culture. It's not the same as California. It's not the same as uh, Eastern Washington, which is not the same as Western Washington. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if if we can't get back to this point of saying um, we can come together in local communities and solve local problems, uh, I don't see how we can have um, how we can have any sort of uh, responsible progress on the culture front. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah. no, and that's effectively shut down by understanding mm -hmm. localism and states' rights as a racial dog whistle only. Oh, yeah. Or even just confined to a far right idea. Right. It's just a far yeah. right yeah. racist idea. Yeah. So you. And but, that's all you know, localism is. That, that's. Well, uh, but you know, go ahead. Oh, you've seen ju just recently, I don't know if you've seen this uh, video that's gone viral of. Um, Sinclair Networks. Uh, it's a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. By your laughter, I take it you have seen it. <laughs> yeah. So the reaction to that is, is a pushback against this hegemony. You know, mm -hmm. where the idea, if you haven't seen it, all of these local TV Quote, stations, local. yeah, locally owned TV stations are fr are basically franchises of uh, Sinclair Broadcasting, mm -hmm. and they have some editorial control and they've been pushing out some they've been pushing out press releases to all these local news shows local you know talk shows whatnot right. and one of them was uh they had this editorial railing against the rise of fake news so in this video they have they basically line up and play together all these drones you know Droning reading in unison fake news uh, this editorial which was, you know, presented without a frame on around it in each uh -huh. local station, basically saying, "Well, here's what we think about here's, fake you know news. the newscasters, the the local trusted <laughs> news authority presenter, and they were if you play them all simultaneously, it's it's unnerving. <laughs> and has anyone said it? Has anyone just said that this was fake news about whole... fake news? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you know, I mean, yeah. like through the looking glass. Right, right. But that's yeah. the pushback, the reaction to that, and it is getting some reaction. Good, thank uh, you. It is like you're saying. I think there's this pushback against this. I, you know, towards you know, we're, we're allowed to have our local news. You know, we're allowed yeah. to have our local editorial control. Right. And I'm very strongly in favor of that, and very opposed. You know, if, if everyone wants to franchise some show or whatnot, then oh no, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, that's one thing. But if you're gonna be reading a press release from your corporate overloads or overloads, <laughs> overloads, <laughs> um, frame it. You know, put a. Say, this is this a press is, release from the corporate overlords. Yeah, I'm reading this under yeah. duress <laughs> or something. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I mean, there's another side of local. You can blink torture and, into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that there's another side of localism, too, and that's that, you know, it, it requires that people are willing to give up some things. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. When I moved to Sweden, um, basically we made a decision we'd send the kids to English language schools because we didn't know how long we'd be there and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I asked, this, I asked one of the schools, I said, so um, 
are, do we have to live in Malmo to go to the Malmo uh, English language schools? And they said, no, you can live anywhere except Berlov. Why Berlov? Well, they won't <laughs> sign tuition waivers because they feel like if you want that kind of education, you have to live somewhere else. <laughs> now, the thing is, you know, my sense on this actually, e even as a, uh, you know, is that, you know, this is actually kind of cool because it means that the community can decide we want to have a certain, um, we want to have a certain cohesion. And of mm. course, under Swedish rules, they still have to take in refugees and so forth right. um, as apportioned. And those refugees then have their kids go through the regular Swedish system, uh, system of schools. But, mm -hmm. um, but they're basically saying we don't want expats to live here. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, the, the flip side of that is where we ended up was a town called Lanskrona, which, by the way, uh, if any of your listeners are um, uh, follow this whole um, some fake news concept of the no-go zones, um, mm -hmm. the oh, whole yeah. concept, uh, yeah. the whole uh, town of Lanskrona has been called one. <laughs> yeah, no-go zone. Um, because uh, back in the 1990s, half of the town was filled with uh, refugees from the Balkan Wars. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, Lanskrona was a wonderful place to live. Um, you know, I mean, half the town is, you know, Bosnian and Serbian and, you know, Croatian and Albanian and such. Mm -hmm. But Lo and behold, um, not a shithole. <laughs> dun, dun. Right. But, but the thing is, you know, I mean, you know, uh, the, the flip side of the localism is everybody came together and said, you know, um, we don't we don't legally have to, but you know, we will charge a slightly higher taxes, mm -hmm. and we'll pay for the full kindergarten costs for everybody. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. You don't you know, see so, a lot of that kind of like civic spirit <laughs> civic anymore. Spirit. <laughs> yeah. And and you know that's a uh, that's the sort of trade off that. That, that I think people, you know, have to start to get comfortable with. And, and I don't mm -hmm. see very many Americans being comfortable with that trade-off yet. No, no, not by a long well, shot. Well, you not know, so, so many of us economically are in a position of near desperation. <laughs> you know, even us talking uh, yeah. about our second house, you know. We're, near desperation. We're, yeah. So. That, well, in desperate to get rid Move of the second Europe. house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, the is conversations it, has come it, up. Yeah. I mean, is it Europe too? Is, I guess it is more and more under austerity, but. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not as bad as this year. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. different. Yeah. It, it's, the UK a is kind more of a functional mess. welfare state. Yeah, I hear it. The I UK hear looks more like the US and less like mainland Europe. Well, the but, situation well, with like London property has just gone psychotic. Right. From, where, but, where, where do you think we in the US got everything? Kind of yeah, like right. the idea from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. yeah. All right. Well, it, it's. I don't want to keep uh, Chris, you know, up the rest all of his night. Or, all night. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah, we should probably be winding up. Winding um, I think just going by the listeners, uh, mm -hmm. we get more plays if the show is uh, more like ninety minutes and less like three mm -hmm. hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus, so. plus uh, it will be better if I can go get some sleep in not too long. It's, yeah. uh, good deal. Yeah. Well, what right. time is it there? Uh, it's almost ten p.m. Okay. Oh, hey, yeah. yeah, yeah. We really appreciate your patience in us getting set up. Um, you know, we've got the the gear working, so if I don't touch anything or even look at it or breathe on oh, it, it, it ought to be working again in the future. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and uh, thank you very much for for coming in. For oh, I did want to. I did want to say. Any last thoughts? Anything that you were holding? Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, not not really. I not mean, really. okay. The, yeah. the the thing is, you know. As you've pointed out, so many of these are cultural issues. I guess there's one more thing I'd mention uh, on the whole gun control side. Mm -hmm. At one point, I started actually trying to do scatter plots on uh, homicide rates versus uh, gun ownership per capita. Mm -hmm. And um, I chose homicide rates, not gun violence rates, because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I usually I don't particularly care whether somebody tries to kill me with a knife or a gun. I just prefer that not to happen. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, but uh, what what I found was that you know I mean you look at some countries like Indonesia which are very safe in this regard and they have a safety record they have a safety rating that's pretty close to that of Switzerland mm -hmm. um, but the but the per capita gun ownership is is very very different and mm -hmm. my the, my interpretation of that is I think there are two big factors the first one is um, economic security. 
mm-hmm. um, in, in the general sense, because th- there's a kind of economic security I've seen in the U.S. that I haven't seen anywhere else where people are effectively, you know, one or two paychecks away from uh, destitution. Yeah, losing their, um, becoming homeless. Losing everything. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you don't see that anywhere else that, that, that I've lived, and that includes places like Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the second thing is, you know, a, a culture where people are connected to other people and uh, effectively uh, well integrated in society seems to be a positive thing. And then cultures where people are very isolated um, t- seems to be uh, a correlation to to more violence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm 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 actually of the opinion that the per capita gun ownership is is not a very good indicator. Right. of um of violence as a whole i mean and and so people look yeah. at gun violence yeah. and it's a it's a self-serving metric for a particular um agenda rather than the question of how do we have a safer society which i think is something we all want yeah. which again is beyond gun regulation right and the anger <laughs> the anger issue that this uh, slate article talks about you know not mental illness but <laughs> but anger acting out you yeah. know is um that is a cultural issue you know yeah. it's not yes, we're not um, you know americans you know there's many things wrong with americans but yeah we're not like uh, although we are founded by you know criminals and splitters and whatnot <laughs> we're, uh, genetically there's nothing that unusual about our makeup compared to the rest of the world if there was australia would be <laughs> a murder capital of the world, right? <laughs> so i'm um, yeah. you know it's the these these you know, young male, males mostly, right. um, with their sense of rage and entitlement to that, to act out that way. That's not a genetic issue. It's not a, a mental health political issue. issue. It's, it's, not a, it's not even a mental health issue, although right. mental health in America yeah. is bad. It's bad. That's true. But the, you have to the, define mental health there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. right, right. But the enabling of this, uh, this, this, well, this violence, this agreed violence, this acting out, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. entirely a, how how you know how the culture promotes that and how they're right, raised yeah. and and that's nurtured in ways that mm-hmm. that don't mm-hmm. make even make sense in other contexts. All right, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks again, Chris. I really appreciate this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it was it was fun. Thanks again. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Potscast. Check out the show blog at potscast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Potscast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye.